<clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started in just a minute as we allow for more attendees to join the call. Again, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrew Sorensen, spokesperson here at CU Boulder. I'll be moderating today's call. Some quick housekeeping items before we get started. If you have a question for the experts on today's webinar, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. You can start doing that now. We will do our best to get to all questions. If we do not get to your question, you can reach us at colorado.edu forward slash COVID-19. Also, our experts will uh, be here to answer your questions until the questions run out. If by chance we have no more questions prior to the scheduled ending of the webinar, we will end early. And as a reminder, today's call will be recorded and that recording will be available at our COVID-19 website. On today's call, we have Catherine Eggert, Senior Vice Provost for Academic Planning and Assessment, and Jennifer McDuffie, Associate Vice Chancellor for Health and Wellness. She's also heading up our Campus Pandemic Response Office. We also have with us Laura Arroyo, Director of Housing Administration in the Division of Student Affairs, and Mark Hyatt, Police Commander with the CU Boulder Police Department. We'll turn it over to Katherine Eggert, who will get us started today with some opening comments. Thank you, Andrew, and thanks to all who are joining us for today's webinar. We are now into the third week of our spring semester and we remain on track to return as planned to our blend of in-person, hybrid in-person and remote instruction modes on February 15th. What this means is that starting on February 15th, which is a Monday, every class will be taught in the instructional mode that was listed when students registered for classes. So if you signed up for an in-person class, for example, that class will be taught in person starting February 15th. If you signed up for a remote class, that class will stay remote. Until then, we're continuing in fully remote learning. I'm pleased to report that all of our faculty have worked hard to improve the online experience. They've worked with each other and they've worked with uh, assistance from our Center for Teaching and Learning and our Office of Information Technology to make online teaching as good as it can be for our students. We've also made it a point more generally to take the lessons of the fall semester and to apply them to the spring semester. We've done a careful look with data compiled by our faculty experts at how successful was our preparation of classrooms labs and learning spaces in the fall semester. As I've previously mentioned, we did not have a single known case in the fall semester of transmission of the virus in the labs or the classroom. So we feel very confident in our classroom, laboratory and workspaces. We're very excited to continue with this, this semester. And with that, I'll turn things over to my colleague in student affairs, Jennifer McDuffie. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. We're so grateful to our community for the continued public health support um, and efforts such as the town hall. A few important updates. Um, students who live in residence halls can start moving back by appointment starting this Sunday, February 7th. I'll share more about monitoring and testing in a moment. 
but it remains very important that our students return in a healthy and safe way. We are really looking at the semester um, as an expansion and an opportunity to build on the public health efforts. A few um, just brief numbers for you in looking at our dashboard. We are currently in Boulder County at level orange. And what this means is high risk. Yesterday, we completed approximately 796 monitoring tests on campus, 136 PCR diagnostic tests, and non positive test results came back. We have zero spaces and isolation in use. We're getting a lot of questions about the variant. We are working with local public health agents, such as Boulder County Public Health, as well as the state and continue to monitor any information available. What we know is the prevention efforts remain the same. We must follow masking. We must follow physical distancing, testing, and participate in contact tracing and case investigation. We know that those are effective in preventing the spread of this virus. Likewise, we need every one of us to commit to those. More importantly, we need to make sure that we don't gather um, beyond the current restrictions in place. In Boulder County, personal gatherings are currently limited to 10 people from no more than two households. These approaches of public health are the best weapons we have against the virus and all of its variants. A few questions have come up recently about double masking. Health experts are saying that by wearing a surgical mask with a cloth mask over it, it does give you an extra layer of protection. The CDC has not issued an official guidance on double masking. However, the evidence suggests two masks are likely more effective than a single mask. The current guidance from Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment is to wear at least one mask. Last Friday, Governor Polis provided an update to the prioritization list regarding vaccines. A few updates are noted below, and we recognize there's a lot of questions about vaccines right now. Phase 1B will now be known as phase 1B1, which is where we are right now. This includes Coloradans over 70, as well as moderate risk healthcare workers and first responders. Phase 1B2 includes Coloradans age 65 to 69, as well as pre-K through 12 educators and childcare workers and licensed programs. They will begin getting the vaccination February 8th. Unfortunately, this does not include instructors in higher education. We are doing our best to advocate for public health measures and continue to make the classroom one of the safest places on our campus. As Dr. Eggert noted, we continue to monitor mitigation efforts in cases. And we also are working to do everything that we can to advocate for our Institute of Higher Education's faculty, instructors, and students who are in the classroom. Phase 1B3 includes frontline essential workers and Coloradans age 16 to 64 with two or more risk conditions. They will be able to start getting vaccinated in early March, estimated March 5th. Also within this update, the state is expected to update its dial. This would be based on how many people are infected with COVID-19, coupled with the number of people who have been vaccinated. As we mentioned last week, our testing protocols for the spring semester have expanded. Those living in on-campus housing are required to get tested weekly through our monitoring program. Our students returning to own campus housing are accustomed to this process, and we thank them for their participation and protecting our herd. We're also expecting all of our faculty, staff, and students who come to campus to get tested weekly. 
New this semester will be a major expansion of incentives for those who participate in monitoring and utilization of the buff pass. We'd like this to be a good experience and we hope that this incentive program, as well as the expedited times that we've taken will benefit the campus. Testing remains available to all those with a Buff One card and their immediate family and household members. For information on testing sites, visit the Protect Our Herd webpage at colorado.edu backslash protect hyphen our hyphen herd. Finally, faculty and staffs and students need to remember to complete the buff pass before engaging in any on campus activities. We're looking forward to rolling out enhancements to the buff pass later this month and hope it becomes that one stop shop for all testing and symptom tracking. One last thing, we are seeing an uptick in COVID cases across the country in the first two weeks after students have returned to in-person instruction. It's really important that our students understand that the vaccination process is barely beginning. Things aren't safe yet, and we really need everyone to comply with facial coverings, hand washing and other hygiene strategies, physical distancing, distancing protocols, and all public health prevention to stop the further spread of the virus. Now I'd like to turn it over to Andrew for question and answer. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer and Catherine. We'd like to give you all the maximum amount of time to answer your questions. If you have questions, again, please use that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna be prioritizing from uh, questions from students and family members. We have a question in here for the student affairs team. Uh, could you please make it a priority to organize slash allow student organizations back on campus this spring in larger areas? Oh, <clears throat> pardon me. I would propose this means actively quote unquote inviting students back onto campus to participate in assisting them versus leaving it up to their own devices. All of this requires you to start mandating all off campus students to test. Many colleges are already doing this. Laura or Jennifer, do you want to take that one? So we can talk a little bit. And Laura, if you don't mind, jump in if I get something incorrect or I forget something. But I think the conversation or the question is really important. We know from our students that not only are they creative, but they're very solution oriented and they want to be part of this process. And they have been. And we've been engaging with various student groups as well as students who've reached out and shared amazing feedback around what types of engagement, what types of activities, what types of guidance would be really helpful. Um, and so I think that to the question, if I understood it correctly, Andrew, um, our students um, are part of the solution. And what we're trying to do right now before um, classes start in person is finalize guidance document related to the dial and what you can do. Provide programming on evenings and weekends that support the dial and gatherings, which may limit our groups to 50, but it does allow for gatherings. It's to expand the in-person dining and other experiences like study space and classroom opportunities so that we can provide a safe, um, but a really robust student experience. Laura, did I forget anything or would you like to add anything to that? Jennifer, you did great. Um, what I would say is that, you know, in the fall, I think there's probably, sometimes it's, it's hard to help folks understand how many things were actually planned. In the fall, we had over 500 different events for our students and those are both on-campus students and off-campus students. In the residence halls, we're making sure that our students are supported to have communities that matter and are meaningful. And that means creating programs that are not only um, virtual, but also programs that are available within the residence hall um, that are done safe, safely with COVID 
COVID restrictions. Uh, so we're thinking about safety, we're thinking about in-person opportunities as well as virtual opportunities. Um, what I will also say is that it's really important that we continue to think of social distancing and we think about how many students we can realistically have in a space that is safe, right? That's, that's thoughtful about COVID-19 restrictions. And we also need to also identify that only providing virtual um, opportunities for students um, isn't meeting what students are asking for either. So there's a, a healthy balance that I think we need to create between the two. And this is for both of our on-campus students as well as our off-campus students. Wonderful, thanks so much. Uh, question for Katherine Egger. Can we open up the library and other big building study areas to give students more study spaces on campus outside of dorms or apartments? Not everyone can study in their bedroom. Also, please relax the appointment scheduling. Thanks for that question, because that's something we definitely heard in the fall semester is that students uh, need more space on campus to study. So the library is opening study spaces for the spring semester. They have a, a reservation system and students can also uh, schedule study spaces elsewhere on campus through our find your study space um, uh, uh, function. And that will also uh, connect you to the library. We are have, uh, you know, the advantage of a winter break and these first few weeks of class being uh, remote is that that's given our facility staff time to explore more study spaces on campus and they're working to expand those study spaces that are available for appointment. We do need to keep our appointment scheduling process in place though. One of the, um, the, the best helps for contact tracing if we need to contact trace is to know who is using a particular room at a particular time. So I know it's annoying to have to schedule a space to study, but it really does help in our COVID mitigation strategies. Wonderful, thank you so much. A uh, question here for Jennifer McDuffie. Uh, my question is if my classes are going back to in-person on February 15th, but I don't feel safe or comfortable because of COVID and I have underlying health problems slash high risk, do I have any options to continue online? Thank you. Um, yes, I would say, you know, first of all, thank you for asking the question and for sharing that. Um, we want to make sure that there's a physical safety element, but also recognizing that this is a holistic conversation when you're talking about COVID-19. And so if there's a situation in which um, you as a student are looking to reach out to someone, I'd recommend disability services um, as a good advocate if there's a reason in which uh, they can meet with you and talk about options. I think the other piece is, you know, it may be best depending on what types of classrooms. We've seen a lot of instructors who have really committed to um, providing classroom opportunities and experiences for the entire semester. And so when students sign up for courses, they can see in what type of modality um, the course will be offered in. So having that conversation with their professor or maybe their um, advisor is also a, a good conversation prior to course enrollment. Dr. Eggert, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I would add that uh, if, a, if a student is now in the third week of class and has changed their mind about taking an in-person class, they really need to talk to their advisor right away. Our, our faculty who are teaching classes in person starting on February 15th um, are, are committed to teaching in person and will not necessarily have the means or the technology to be able to teach a remote student at the same time. So talk to your advisor right away because if you're in, in a class that is listed as in person or hybrid in person, uh, you need, may need to make some quick arrangements. Okay, thank you. Uh, question for Laura Arroyo. Can events be hosted by leadership with students so they can get to know you all, name to the face, 
events such as pancakes with student affairs, free donuts with COO, president's office, sports, t-shirt giveaway, etc. If these events are uh, ongoing, then you might have a more responsive student body when urgent items occur. This was a big miss last fall. This is such a great question and also super creative, some of the ideas that folks have already come up with. Um, yes, absolutely. I think about first, there's opportunities for us to give incentives to the folks that are really doing this right, that are thinking through all of the COVID-19 restrictions and the safety measures that we have in place and supporting those measures. Um, our students are, are doing such a great job. And I think that really what we need to make improvement in and work on is supporting those students to acknowledge that and really let them know um, that we appreciate all of their efforts. That's something that we've been making movement in in the fall and we want to continue for the spring as well. And then I'll just reiterate um, it's really a balance between providing um, opportunities that are virtual while also providing opportunities for in-person um, um, connections for students. And I'll say this for two reasons. One, of course, is COVID-19 safety. But the other piece that I think we've learned through, um, through COVID is that there's opportunities that we can provide virtually that are more inclusive for students. Um, and that could be for their safety or it could be because of their accommodations that they need or their ability to attend. And so there's real opportunity that exists within the virtual realm that I think is inclusive to all students also. Um, so like I said, it's a balance, but I think we can do both. And um, I'm writing down all of these ideas because they're great ideas and they're things that I think that we can do. And I know that I miss a lot of the in-person connections. So any chance that we can do that is exciting. I think we all do, Laura. A uh, question for Jennifer McDuffie here. Will there be any increased testing of residential or commuter students in the spring and what is the priority level of CU students and staff slash faculty being vaccinated? Will there be any vaccination distribution on site? Good questions. I'll start with the testing one and make sure I hit the other two. Um, for testing, the expectation is that any person, commuter or, or someone who lives off campus and can walk across the street is getting tested weekly. Um, if you're coming to campus, you're expected to get testing. Um, and I think that the piece that we're really excited about is not only offering um, more expanded testing, mobile testing, hopefully where we have um, the second week of February, where we have testing that can be placed in multiple uh, areas around the campus um, to help uh, support the testing needs so that you don't necessarily have to go to SEEK or the UNMC, um, but there'll be a mobile testing site that can rotate. But I think the other piece is incentivizing that good behavior. Um, and we have amazing faculty, staff, and students, and how do we uh, support, whether it's swag or gift cards, or how do we call out that really good behavior? because we know our faculty, staff, and students want to be part of protecting our herd and being in that community. The second question I believe was around um, vaccinations. And I wanna be really clear about vaccines. We are doing everything that we can to support our own campus community as a provider. We are one provider in Boulder County. We are not the only. So on campus, we are providing vaccines as they are available to us. And we are working down uh, the prioritization or eligibility list that the state has provided in a phased approach. So we have been able to work with um, faculty, staff, and students who may fall within that category of above 70 or older, um, or who are in the categories as determined by the state. Andrew, did I miss anything? Um, I think that covers it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Yeah, sorry, multi-parter. Apologies. <laughs> uh, question for Laura and the student affairs team. Please consider adding paid student ambassadors so they can help with providing masks or other guidance in areas of compliance during the day. There's an over-dependency on RA slash dorm leads for freshmen to enforce rules and a softer peer approach may work better based on uh, what is working at other universities. Thank you. Absolutely, glad to help. 
Um, within my portfolio, I work with housing, so all of our on-campus housing as well as off-campus housing and neighborhood relations. Um, and I'm so impressed with the work that they've done throughout COVID. Um, our off-campus folks have added and increased the student ambassador program significantly, and that has been an important build out for COVID, but also for all of our students that live off campus to provide them support. That's both through peer mentorship, it's through relationships, it's also through education. Um, I think about some of the opportunities for um, information that we were able to get out to students um, in different ways than just email or just a webinar potentially, a more in-person connection that I know our students off campus are yearning for and um, we're all missing. So we have continued to increase that program. I think that we will continue to increase in the spring as well um, based on the need and based on our ability, um, understanding also that, that Students are, are busy humans and trying to get students to connect off campus can be difficult because they've already created in ways their communities. So it's a different role than RAs, um, but it's an important role. I will say that that role um, is also really started and built long before the student ambassadors begin. It's really making sure that we're thinking of the transition of our current students into the off-campus community. Um, and that's work that we have invested in, that we continue to work towards to really build a strong relationship between our on-campus students and their transition into the off-campus housing and Boulder community. Wonderful, thank you. We did receive a comment about access and COVID-19 information more frequently. You can find a weekly COVID-19 update every Thursday in CU Boulder Today editions. You can also sign up for a weekly COVID-19 digest that's emailed on Sunday mornings. You can attend these campus Q&A sessions every Tuesday or visit colorado.edu forward slash COVID-19 for complete information about how the campus is operating during the pandemic. Another question here for Jennifer McDuffie. You mentioned we're advocating for faculty, instructors, and students to get vac uh, vaccinated. What about frontline staff providing essential services on campus? Why prioritize, prioritize, apologies, instructors when you said no transmission has occurred in the classroom and leave off those who are frontline essential services that have led to stay in person throughout uh, the pandemic? Andrew, thank you. And thank you for the question because I wanna make sure that, um, that, that this is very important, but I wanna make sure it's not missed. Our frontline workers and anyone who's deemed essential are a priority. And we are following the guidance as provided by Colorado um, and Boulder County Public Health. And frontline workers and essential workers are spelled out as part of that phase 1B3. And so I want to be very clear um, that our, our faculty, our staff, our students are so critical. That's, that's exactly why we're here. And I think that they're our most valuable resource. And so when you look at the phase distribution, that 1A, 1B1, 1B2 and 1B3 can be a bit confusing, but please know that frontline and essential workers are spelled out, um, as well as in phase two and three, more information is being shared around educators who aren't K through 12 and ECE. Um, and we continue to ask um, as, as we go through the phases um, that uh, our community read our Thursday updates that you just mentioned, because that's where we're sharing where we are with vaccine distribution and any information or guidance we've received. Okay, thank you so much. A uh, question for Laura Arroyo, what dining options are available on campus this spring? Yes, that's such a great question. Um, our dining staff are in-house. I think many of you know that, but I think that's a really important um, designation for CU. It's something that our students have loved, our families have loved. Um, this year, more than ever, it's been challenging. Um, we've needed to really recreate how we provide thoughtful dining operations and opportunities and flexibility and variety for students. Um, there's a lot of things that are coming in the spring, both because we've learned. We've learned what we can do and what we need to do as we move forward. And we've learned a lot about what students are requesting. I think one of the, the biggest things that students are requesting, that kind of two things, variety and opportunity. Um, instead of only going to the Center for Community, 
we want to make sure that students are aware of all of the places on campus uh, that they can go for a dining option. And that also creates variety and excitement because depending on the place on campus, there's different opportunities for the food that you may receive. Um, we're, we're expanding operation in the Alfred Packer Grill. Um, we're expanding operation when we think about the Village Center, um, Sewell Dining Hall, which I think is a special favorite both for the Sewell community as well as students over in Central Campus, um, that will be open on the weekends. Um, across the board though, what we're also thinking about is what are the healthy options that we can provide and how do we expand those options so that students really feel like they have choices. Um, what we can't do yet is open up the dining halls in the same way that I think we would hope and like to be. Um, and that's due to COVID-19 safety. We need to be thoughtful about students in space um, and make sure that, that we're not um, putting too many students in one space um, and creating an unsafe experience. So what we're gonna focus on and what dining is really focusing on is providing those options, creating variety, um, making sure that we're spreading out students so that when they return, they're not waiting in the same way that I think they were impacted by in the fall. Um, but it's it's an exciting time in dining. It's causing a lot of innovation in the in the process and in the variety of what we're doing. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, question for Catherine Eggert and or Jennifer McDuffie: Might in person small groups, maximum ten uh, outdoor off campus STEM field classes, be allowed during the summer? I'll I'll start, and Jennifer can chime in uh, on the health angle. So we are still working on plans for the summer in terms of, of offering in-person and remote and hybrid offerings. So we should be announcing those pretty soon. I think mid-February is the, is the goal for, for that announcement. Uh, field experiences, it's going to depend on, on the class, whether it can be offered in-person, outdoors. Some field experiences classes um, share equipment when they're in person and that's very, very difficult to do under COVID regulations. So we will work with each instructor uh, who's, or each department I should say, who are teaching those classes in the summer to see if they can be offered in person uh, when we decide about offering in-person classes. Jennifer, did I get anything wrong there? Okay. If Jennifer okay. says I'm good, I'm good. So. Great. Uh, another question for Jennifer. Uh, this person says they feel that Boulder Health had a very heavy hand in CU operations or CU has allowed that and every discussion conversation involves them. I'm not seeing that at other universities. Do you want to explain that a little bit? Absolutely. And thank you for the observation. Um, we are we recognize that Boulder is a very unique place, one being the flagship institution and knowing that our community is really important and engaged with the community around us, the city of and Boulder County. And I think during the pandemic, it's really strengthened our partnerships um, and our reliance on one another because you know there's not artificial walls or barriers around the campus and what we do here can really impact the city and county. And so our modes of operation, our leaders have really come together with Boulder County Public Health, with um, the Boulder Valley School Districts and St. Vrains to really see how we can be the best partners. Um, and so we're grateful for the partnership with Boulder County Public Health, but we also recognize that for much of what we're doing, that our local public health agencies are the experts. And in Colorado, um, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment has really take, uh, taken a distributed approach with um, the authority of the local public health agencies um, and how we look at mitigation efforts, how we look at distribution plans. And so we're very grateful for our partnership with Boulder County Public Health. And the observation, just to let you all know, um, we do have meetings with other universities. And I think it's been interesting because perspective, you know, is always, uh, is always something that I'm looking at. And a lot of people have really been proud of and encouraged by our partnership and have come to us to see how 
um, they can do this outside of Colorado. So I, I think that, um, that we're grateful and we're recognizing that um, our community um, can impact others and we want it to be a very positive experience. Thank you. A uh, question for Mark Hyert and Laura, how have CU and city law enforcement adjusted to dealing with large off-campus gathering issues that you saw in the fall semester, especially around Greek houses? Also, what kind of communications have off-campus students received this semester regarding uh, what the current public health orders are and what is expected of them? So uh, there was no uh, roadmap for how to do uh, public health order enforcement um, out in the community uh, as it came to some of the large gatherings last fall. We made a lot of progress with that. Um, we partner daily with the City of Boulder Police Department where most of the violations um, that are being reported are coming in from. Um, and as part of that, the system has been um, heavily forticated, uh, you know, uh, built up so that we can get uh, that information. And then um, what we really need from folks that are reporting this is to give as much as they can provide. So if it's, you know, specifics to residents, um, who those individuals are, and then that gives us a foothold. Um, and what we found was the most effective means was to be able to get that back to our Office of Student Conduct. Um, and since that system's now in place, that's the hope is that that'll happen um, uh, much quicker and much more efficiently. The other part of this that we did, and I see in the question is specific to Greek houses. So um, the city of Boulder and ourselves have met with the um, IFC and um, with the Greek houses and had conversations um, in, in regards to what the expectations are and what law enforcement will be doing um, at, to address those public health order violations. Thanks, or Mark. anything to add? <laughs> Absolutely. I'll talk a little bit about communication, um, just to add on to what Mark has shared. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to the folks that I know are being impacted also within the Boulder community. Um, we are hearing you, we're listening to you, um, we're hearing your concerns and the impacts that it's, it's having for you within the Boulder community. Um, I think what's most important is that we think about this from a communication standpoint and then also engage our student leaders in the process. Um, so one thing that I think that CU has been really proud to do this year is think about our student organizational leaders in fraternity and sorority life, all of our Greek students, and really bring them into the solution. Um, and that is an important change and an important movement for CU that I think is really positive um, because often students will listen to students a little bit quicker. Um, so engaging them in that is really important. Um, the other thing I will say is that we have really thought about how we can communicate information about the, the Boulder um, health orders and impacts, and then also our CU expectations. Um, and we're doing that in a whole variety of ways. And, and that's important because students may see one avenue and they may find another. So some of that is thinking through obvious sources like uh, newsletters and um, providing it through email. And then it's also thinking about our student ambassadors, our um, Greek leaders, our student leaders within the community that can share this information, or even as far as providing door hangers on every door. Um, and that has been important because not every student uh, looks at communication the same way. So we need to really be thoughtful in our approach and expansive in our approach. Um, so I, I've been really proud about the work that has, has moved us forward from the fall, what we've learned, um, what we've developed and how that can proceed. Recognizing also that whenever you have a group of students that arrive back on campus, it's a moment of reteaching and relearning a little bit um, because there's been a break. So there's a lot that we're doing right now to make sure that we're re-educating and, and preparing preparing for the upcoming semester. Thank you. Uh, another question for you there, Laura. Uh, will sophomores be able to live on campus next fall uh, in the upcoming fall 2021 semester? That's a great question. Um, first, I want to apologize. I know that some of our timelines um, that our students have expected and, and usually have been out um, for, for fall 2021 housing, um, they've just been delayed. And some of that is due to COVID-19 and, and some of the preparation that we need to do for COVID. And then some of that is also um, just when you start at the beginning of the year with a little bit of a delayed semester, it takes some time to replan. Um, but we're gonna be providing that information here in the, in the next two weeks to our um, rise 
advising second year students. Um, we've heard from our, our students currently that are living with us that some of them really want to move off campus and then other students really would like to continue in housing. Um, and I think that that is an important change that we're thinking about and reflecting on. I think it also is directly connected to students feeling like this year has been different than what they expected their first year um, experience to be. So we're trying to consider that as much as we can and create as many avenues for students to live on campus as possible. Also recognizing that a large number of our, our current first year students that are rising second years will move off campus um, into the Boulder community. So as I said before, that also means that we need to think about that transition, um, preparing students for that transition and what our expectations are for when they do move off into the Boulder community so that they are good community members. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us today. If you have more questions or would like to see additional information, you can do so by visiting our COVID-19 website. Again, that is colorado.edu forward slash COVID-19. There's a chat at the bottom right-hand corner of the site where you can ask questions. If you'd like, CU Boulder will host another update on Tuesday, February 9th from noon to 1 p.m. Mountain Time. These updates will occur on a weekly basis throughout the spring semester and will uh, with the last webinar scheduled currently for Tuesday, April 27th. Boulder County Public Health is also hosting community briefings this year every Wednesday at 3.30 p.m. BCPH's agenda for those meetings moving forward is to provide updates to the Boulder County Public Health leadership, updates from public health professionals on current topics such as the vaccine, testing, and data, as well as updates from local partners. Lastly, the City of Boulder does a once a month briefing on the third Thursday of every month. Those are from 3 to 4 p.m. Mountain Time. We will now end today's call. Thank you again for joining.